start by um, giving the, the credits to everyone who has uh, been involved in the research in case at the end there is not so much time to, to thank people. Um, so I should mention first that there are two PhD students. In the second half of my talk I will be really uh, discussing work that they have done. So James Morley has finished and is now in a, a, math, a mathematics startup uh, that is based in Reading University in the UK. Um, and Adam Callison has a few months more of his PhD before he finishes um, at Imperial College, also in the UK. So Gemma and Stephanie are highlighted because they are here. Um, so uh, just starting their PhDs, so good to make contacts and discussion with all of you. Um, there are many undergraduate uh, projects involved also in this. I will mention some of them as we go along. <coughs> And also at Durham, to mention in my group, there is Nick Chancellor, um, who is a, an innovation fellow. He will see his name appear in uh, some of the publications later. Um, his postdoc is Ji Chen, um, and his PhD student is Laura Nita. Um, and their work is not so much in this talk. Collaborators, important. So Dom Horsman is, will be here later. We do not have a uh, time of arrival yet because there was some interaction between uh, the, the trains and the bank cards and the cancellations and um, anyway, he will be here. He is uh, um, on the program committee, so that's why you recognize his name. Um, so he spent uh, two and a half years in Durham and I have known him for since a long time for the collaborations. Susan Stepney is a computer scientist at York. Um, and in the first half of the talk um, is really a uh, key collaborator. So um, that with the credits done, let's see an overview of what I'd like to tell you about. Since I have the introductory talk, I thought I should um, set some background to some aspects of quantum walks um, that will help to set where uh, the following all the rest of your work sits in relation to it, each piece. So I want to discuss a little bit modeling versus simulation, these being the kind of the two key things that this conference series is looking at, using quantum walks as models and, um, and so simulation of, of quantum systems. So I'm going to talk um, in the first half about a, a framework to understand how we do science and, and uh, computation and engineering. Um, as background. And then I'll look um, and take a piece of that, which is um, how we can solve classical problems using quantum walks to compute. So I'm going to take one aspect of how we use quantum walks rather than um, the modeling. And then I will tell you some about the work with the search problem and solving spin glass problems. Um, that is the work the two PhD students have done. And I will finish with a little bit more then about looking at the difference between what we're doing and universal quantum computing with quantum walks um, and some summary and outlook. Okay, so let's start with a diagram that I drew many years ago because people were complaining that what I was doing with my numerical simulations wasn't doing something very useful compared to doing a mathematical proof. And so I wanted to set the things in relationship to each other and say, it's not about whether one is better than the other or, or whatever, it's about how they work together. Um, so this is really about doing physics rather than doing pure mathematics. In pure mathematics, experiments takes a slightly different form. Um, at least it's not physical experiments, but there's an adaption of it. Um, so what we are, so this is the modeling side you see at the top. We make mathematical models of many things. Um, we make a model just because it might be interesting to see how it behaves. We might make a model because 
we want to model a physical system and we want to understand its behavior and be able to predict it. But if we do that, then we are thinking about modeling something where we have some experiment, some, phys some uh, physics lab somewhere where they are doing experiments, they have numerical data, and we want to see how our model compares to the experiment. And there are two basic ways we can understand how the model works. One is to do analytical calculations, and the other is to do numerical simulation on a computer, an ordinary computer. Um, and then for all of these, we can compare and see how uh, where the differences are. We may know that our model is not exact, so we may expect them not to agree exactly. Um, but often it then leads us to revise the model um, and go around the loop again. So in this picture, the computation is testing our models where we cannot do everything analytically. And in any case, if you measure something in an experiment, you will get numbers out of your, um, eventually out of the end of your apparatus. And so it's useful to compare numbers with numbers, and usually that involves a computer somewhere. So there's really an interplay between these things. It's not a, um, you know, it's not a it should not be a tension between them. They should work together. Um, of course, if you don't start with a good model, Everything you do next, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So the model is important to, to, to pick the model well. And then, now, this is to delve, that, that picture is okay, but it doesn't bring out all the relationships between what we're doing quite clearly enough. So, um, so we went digging a deeper on, on what we're doing and discovered that the philosophers had something they call the representation relation that stems in for what we're doing when we are thinking about a, a physical system and how we relate the model, the mathematical model we're making to this physical system. Um, so what I'm drawing up here, it looks like a dualist theory like Descartes, but it's not, and I will come back to that. Um, it's very much a, a realist physical theory, so I'm a physicist. Um, if you're not a realist, you will think about this differently and come to different conclusions, and that's fine. Those are, there are always assumptions in how you do any kind of science. But this is in some ways quite simple. I'm thinking, for example, I have a particle, I have an electron, and maybe I represent it by a Schrodinger equation for the, it's not moving too fast, so I don't need a quantum field theory. I'm happy with a non-relativistic theory. But already there are conditions on when this model will be correct. And you see, um, so that R is standing for this relationship between the physical world and our models of it. And it's theory dependent. If I'm doing teaching electrostatics to first year undergraduates. I will not use this equation, they don't know this yet. Um, but I would be representing it as a point charge with a certain electric charge in, that, in a different theory. And the model then depends on what you are interested in. Um, so always there's a subscript T to indicate the theory we are using um, to relate the, the, between the physical world and the model. Um, there are actually, there's more than one representation relation, but um, these are subtleties we're not going to need to worry about. That we will use one more as we go through. So I can now do a cartoon picture of how we do science. Um, so I've got my representation relation, I've got a physical object, and I've got the model, M of P, of our, that we make of this object. And we have a theory of how it evolves in time. That's our C of, with a subscript T for our theory. And after a certain time, we predict that it's going to be M primed. So our model is now in a different state, for this phys starting from the physical object. And of course, meanwhile, the physical object is evolving in time. It's just doing its thing. This is the physics that we're given in the world. 
and after some time it becomes P primed. So we now want to see, compare, how the physical object is compared to our, the prediction of our model. But in order to compare things, they must be the same type. Um, so we need to do the representation again. So P primed has a model that is now M of P primed. So you can see the primes are in different places. These are two different things. Um, one is the prediction from the initial state that we make in theory. And the other is what the system actually did in our experiment. And so now we can look at these two and go, how close are they? So there's some sort of epsilon for whatever metric you can use, depends what type of measurements you have. Um, and of course, you may know that the model is not exact. And there are always experimental errors or imprecision. Maybe your measurements only have a finite precision. So there will always be some, some level of epsilon in there. Um, maybe not if it's discrete and you're counting. But, um, but we expect epsilon to be non-zero. It's part of, 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 of what our knowledge of, of the world is about. Um, but what we want is a good theory will agree with observation to within a, a small enough epsilon that we can really use this to make predictions. Um, so as I say, some metric wants to have these agreeing to within some small enough precision, and all of that is dependent on this theory that we're working within and the purposes for which we're using this. Um, and if you're testing the latest theories of, of space, time, and gravitation uh, in rel general relativity, you may need very high precision, um, for example, for LIGO or for the, 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 the atomic clocks now, 10 to the minus 19 of a second. They really can tell the difference in gravity between here and here, just in the lab. Or maybe something much more approximate is okay for your purposes, but. Um, but this is all a sort of practice of, of what's the purpose you want to put this to. So, okay, that's a nice picture. It's a cartoon picture because, of course, there are many, many experiments. There are interlocking diagrams like this. You have to test your ap experimental apparatus before you can trust it to use it to do a new experiment. Um, and the philosophers still argue about how all this works. We're not claiming to solve deep philosophical problems with this framework. We just want to be able to reason about the processes and see where it gets us in understanding what we're doing. Um, and as you can guess from my talk title, I'm really interested in computation and where that fits into the picture. So now we can think about engineering and technology in relation to these diagrams. So once you have a good theory and you understand how the, um, the, this uh, physical system works, now you can build things with it. Um, you can design um, a bridge or a built out of the, the latest composite materials uh, to make it light or whatever it is that you, you have a requirement for. And then you have some raw material, and you have to follow the design instructions to create the finished product. Um, and then you should um, do some tests, which would have the representation re relation going the other way. Tests that what you have made actually corresponds to your design specification. But you can see in some shorthand, we could think of this as instantiating something um, that didn't exist before, but we designed it. So we have engineered um, an artifact that we want um, have a use for. Um, and again, there are there's many more details to an actual process like that. But, um, and of course, one of the things that we engineer, among many, many things, are computers. I mean, there's an amazing amount of science and then engineering behind building one of these or your smartphone. Um, they're extraordinary devices in terms of their capabilities. 
Um, so there's building technology and also using it. So for the example I have here, I have an example of using a computer that we've built. So, um, so now my object P is a computer and I've used the shorthand here for the instantiation. I'm saying we can interact with it, we can program it, we can set up a, um, uh, um, a problem on there um, with an initial state. And then we can run the program and look at the output. But the, for computing, what we're doing is we're solving a completely unrelated problem, usually, to the... Um, so we have a problem, we want to compute something, the pen and paper's not getting anywhere. Um, actually, if it was before about 1950 and you said, I need some co a computer, uh, you would be talking about a room full of people who would be sitting there doing the calculations on paper for you. Um, and even the first NASA space flights were... Uh, what the trajectories were computed by humans like this. <coughs> so that's where the word comes from, originally from humans. But then um, to find machines who could do this faster and more reliably, we started to engineer more and more sophisticated devices that would do computing for us. So we have our C, we have our problem up there, and it's not related to the physical device we're doing, using as a computer. So we have to encode it in a way that the, uh, related to our model of the computer, the, we know, okay, we, we know we have the um, C compiler and the Python um, language installed on it, so we're going to use one of those. You have to make choices about how you will encode the problem. Um, and then, and it has to be compatible, and you have to have a more powerful enough computer. There are limits to what you can encode. Um, but assuming you successfully do that, you can then see that what the process of actually using a computer is, is to use a physical artifact, a physical device, and then you re reverse the process to get your answer out. Um, so you can see that, that I have what you did physically versus the theory. We now have them more or less agreeing. You have to trust your engineering is good enough to give you the, um, the right answer if you put the encoded the problem correctly. And then you have to do a decode process to get back to your original problem. Um, and then that dotted line is telling you what you want to do, but what, how, to, how you've done it is come through using the computer, P, um, and then decoding it. So that's what it looks like in this framework to, to actually use a computer. Not to think about computing in an abstract way, but to actually sit there, program, and do, um, and do a problem. So. so if we have a model like this, you see some of my arrows have shrunk to oblivion. Um, that's, I think, not the... Um, uh, I think that's an issue with the PDF generation at a smaller size here. Uh, but the, the double arrow should still be there. So that lets us think a little bit about what some of the, the requirements to be actually computing are. It's a high-level process here. It's, it's not a a simple fundamental physical process. So one of the really obvious ones is that computations must have outputs. If you don't have an output, you can replace the computer by a brick or anything else inanimate, and nothing changes in the picture, right? There's no output, you can't tell the difference of what you have that you put your input into if nothing comes back out. Um, There is also, and I'm not going to say a lot more about this, something that um, we call the representational entity. So remember that representation relation, those missing double arrows, that in some sense owns the computation. Um, and we have a whole, a recent paper from 
and Conventional and Natural Computation and Conference. Um, there will be a journal version in Natural Computing coming out this year. It's already submitted. It's just I don't know the publication date yet. That discusses in a lot more detail how the representational entity fits into the picture. Um, so what I will say here are two things. And it's easy to see that, that we are the representational entity when we're using a computer to solve a problem for us, um, or when we're using our brains, for that matter, as computers. Um, but this is why it's not a dualist theory, because everything that I've labeled abstract there, because it's representing something else for the representational entity, is instantiated somehow is in the representational entity, on the paper we're using, um, and the uh, picture you're seeing on the screen here. So everything is physical. It's just that the, the meaning they have is at a higher level for a more complex um, um, sort of organism. Not, it doesn't need to be human. And so we have a paper here on um, looking at representation in bacteria. Um, we actually don't want to tackle the is the brain a computer question because you get into all sorts of arguments with people about what, um, what form of computation or not the brain has. So we wanted, we're physicists, we like to treat the simple problems first and then understand more complicated as step by step. So, so we went for um, bacteria which are already very complicated um, and we recruited a biologist um, that's the last author there, um, Peter Young, to make sure we got the biology of the bacteria correct. Um, but uh, as I say, I'm not going to talk in detail about that, just to point out that, um, so when I'm talking about engineering, we can think of engineering as, as building something or even animals build things from time to time, shelters or nests or for birds, for example. Um, but we can also think of evolution as an engineering process. Um, <coughs> so I'm, it's not a sort of conscious directed um, act process, but it um, it constantly changes things to make them fit the environment more effectively. So, so in that sense, the, bio, um, the, the bacteria are, uh, have arrived at using representation through evolution. Um, and one of the crucial things is how they represent signals within the cell. They say, you'll have to read the paper for more details on that. Um, So I'm going to skip gears now that I've set a sort of framework for, um, so I've not mentioned anything quantum or walk yet, right? So I think it's time I moved on a little bit. Um, so why do we use computers? Um, it's because we want to increase our, our, our computing power or our information processing power. Um, and We've had a period of, of 60 years or so where computers have regularly got much more powerful almost year on year. You buy the new version and your old one is already grinding to a halt under the new software. Um, however, this has stopped. At least the silicon version of this has now stopped. Um, and to make a silicon computer more powerful, um, you need a radically different design um, not just of what the silicon device, but also probably how it computes. Um, and there are two problems going on here. The energy consumption, people, um, organizations, multinationals, have been just throwing many, many more computers at problems to solve them because they have the money and they can. Um, but it's using up our, our energy resource um, consumption as humans. So globally, computers use some significant percentage of, of humans' energy use. And we can't afford to do more of this with global warming. We really need to be more efficient about how we compute. 
luckily, there is a lot of silicon devices, as they are in the, this computer or your, or your phone, are very far from optimal on their energy use. This is a much more efficient computer in our brain. It works very differently, but the energy use for what it does compared to silicon is, is much more efficient. Um, that Spinnaker project is just one example of redesigning silicon into a lower power device. It, it's still silicon, but it's, um, it's using a neuromorphic, so a completely different way to compute, and, and the power consumption is a lot lower. It's, uh, it, that's in university labs. It's not something you can really buy um, mainstream yet. But these problems are related. The reason we can't make the chips faster is because the physics of silicon, we can't, the, the heat conduction, we cannot take the heat out of the devices any faster, and that means they can't run faster. They would melt otherwise. So we have reached the physical limit of what we can do with this particular design of silicon. And so what you now find people, the, the chip makers make very, there are hundreds of chips you can buy, and they're all optimized for a slightly different application. A smartphone, a high-end smartphone, a, um, uh, something to go on a satellite that must be robust and keep working in space. Or um, There's a chip for everything. One for your toaster if it failed half of the tests. Um, yeah. Um, but they're not getting intrinsically faster by design in silicon. So we need to look somewhere else if we want to get faster computing. And for quite, there's been a, there's a, a whole set of people who've been looking at unconventional computing for, for several decades, but it's been very much a, a small uh, community because, well, you know, uh, this is, the silicon is dominant. We don't really need this stuff. But there have been people looking at the possibilities um, for a long time. This is not new because we suddenly realized we can't make silicon faster forever. So this is just some pictures to give an idea. Um, and so one of these is quantum computing, which is what I'm going to talk about. But um, people are playing around interfacing neurons and silicon or... Uh, seeing if how slime molds can compute, chemical reactions. That picture of the reservoir computing, um, essentially, it's, that's a blob of resin and uh, carbon nanotubes that overlap. So you have, uh, you can, with a bunch of electrodes connected, so then you can see how the signals in one direction are transformed as they come out the other direction. Um, so Susan Stepney has done a lot of work on that and with one of her recent students has developed a whole mathematical theory for how to characterize that sort of computer. And you can do things that are biology or biology inspired and there's a one possible encoding for, for a DNA computer, for example. Future computing is going to be more diverse. If we want to be, have smarter, more energy efficient ways to compute, then there's really a wide open space to, to do some really good science here. It also means we need to co-design the algorithms and the hardware because now they're not two separate things. That's an artificial picture we have if all the hardware is the same underneath. If it's not, we need to think harder about how we do the algorithms, and there's a lot of mathematics to do for that. So this is a little bit more um, focused picture of the, the same thing. Most computers are now hybrids, and they've been hybrids maybe 20 years or more. Um, because your computer will have had a graphics card dedicated to drawing the screen fast enough to do um, those nice movies and games that you're playing on your smartphone. Um, so they've been standard for a long time. So it doesn't have one chip, it has, it has two processors at least. And if you want to do um, high performance computing and you now look at what's on offer in your university or um, near national high performance computing, you'll find that you can find 
a set of nodes that have FPGAs or um, application-specific chips so that you can speed up the uh, most common or and hardest part of the computation that little bit more and gain a little bit more advantage. Um, and whenever we're talking about these unconventional ways to compute, nearly always um, you will find that there's a conventional computer controlling the experiment and interfacing with it. For quantum or NMR or these reservoir computers or even the slime molds, you take pictures and then you have to analyze the images. And how do you do that? Put it on your computer, conventional computer. We take it for granted. But the theory tends to be single paradigm. We have a nice theory of classical computing based on a Turing machine, which looks nothing like the way the silicon works. For analog, we have Shannon's GPAC, which is a nice mathematical theory for solving partial differential equations. In quantum, we have a lot of different models. It hasn't even settled down to one specific theory the way that we have. We can relate them to each other and show that they are equivalent, um, but there are, you have choices about how to model quantum computers. And there are other models in between. So linear optics is a type of computing that is somewhere between quantum and classical. It's not the full quantum. Um, and that's, there's a lot of people interested in the mathematics of what sits between the two layers um, of quantum, universal quantum and, and classical. But what lag, we lag behind is the theory of how to put two of those together. So to put the classical controlling uh, a quantum computer, how how do you get the most out of that combination? Um, and again, there's a whole other section of talk that I'm not going to give here on um, steps towards understanding how to make hybrid computers. Um, again, the tangent, I would get nowhere near quantum walks if I did that. So, um, so we'll head further into quantum computing. Um, now, I just want to put a couple of slides up just to introduce it. I'll go faster through these because I'm assuming at some level most of you know this. So if you look at that top line, and remember my picture that I had of the abstract to physical, there's the input, there's the encode step, and there's the wave function. And so that's my model. I now apply a unitary transformation, so that's my model, or that's where I actually put the physical computer in there to do that. There's my output, decode, and my result. So I've just flattened the diagram down that I had before. And the unitary evolution, it could be a gate sequence, or it could be a Hamiltonian that does it. The T there is now time-ordered because the Hamiltonian uh, is non-commuting elements in it. And that actually covers most of quantum information processing because if you want to do communications, your goal is to get the input and the result to be the same thing, to transmit your message either in space or time or both. And the encode and the decode are where we have our arbitrary choices, where the problem is that is unrelated to our computer is turned into something compatible with that physical device. So here, it's a simple example. I want to represent zeros and ones. And I can choose whether I use spin up or spin down or some other state to be zero. And from a point of view of my output, if I do that consistently, it should make no difference. So there's something arbitrary about how we do the encoding. If you don't know how to decode it, then what you have doesn't mean anything to you. Um, and that's the basis of, of cryptography. Um, if you know how to decode it and someone else doesn't, you have a secret message. So another couple of words about where I'm going with this. It's clear that I'm interested in computing in practice. Um, so where we get something interesting from quantum systems is that their logic is different from the classical logic. 
So this is just a little uh, table of examples where the bits are zero or one, but in quantum we have superpositions. Um, we make binary decisions, but we can run it in a superposition. We don't have to make that decision in the quantum case. In classical, we have to add random numbers as an extra resource, but in quantum, if we make measurements in the right way, we will get randomness as part of the intrinsically built into the theory. And so it's a different logic. We should expect a different type of computation from it. And the question is how different? And what we think is that the computability, so what it's possible to compute is the same. And where it differs is in the complexity, so how efficiently we can compute um, the things that are possible to compute. Okay, so now we have a question about efficiency and what we mean by that. So to get an advantage, if we're going to use a quantum computer, in theory, so complexity theory, it's a branch of mathematics, um, and it's very important to have for understanding the baseline of what's possible. So if you can prove that it's, you cannot get a speed up in, you know, in a setting, these, it's very hard to do these proofs. A lot of the work is relative. Um, then, okay, that's probably not the place to look and try and actually build and use your quantum computer. But, um, and usually what people are looking for is a polynomial scaling with the system size in order to call it efficient. However, what we want in practice is to produce answers on human time scales. Right. How important is this answer? How long are you willing to wait? And how reliable is your computer to compute for days or weeks? And we do run computations for weeks at a time. I've done it. I've published papers that have taken weeks of computational time um, to produce the answer on our current classical computers. Roughly speaking, with quantum, if you just get a polynomial speed up that's quadratic or something like that, it's exploiting the quantum coherence, so the interference effects that you get. To get an exponential speed up, you would have to exploit the parallelism in the, the Hilbert space um, um, in the quantum superpositions. That's a very rough, you know, if you haven't seen this before, that's how to think about it. There's much more nuance than this. But what I'm interested in is to compare real physical devices. And complexity theory alone won't tell you whether they are useful. It's part of the, the picture. And I may be interested, even if all I'm getting is a better prefactor, that the scaling is the same, but the, there's a factor of 10 to the 5 in front of the quantum computer that says it's, it's that much faster. I'm still interested because that will still give me a computational advantage. So um, something the complexity theorists will go, oh, that's not interesting. In practice, if that prefactor, which they never, almost never compute, is big, it might still make a difference. Because the complexity theory is an asymptotic scaling, and I have never seen an asymptotically large computer. Um, we cannot, so they're always finite size, and there's always the possibility that at that finite size, you have an advantage over the largest thing you can build a different way. So. And as I've kept hinting, encoding is really important here. Um, so here is the difference between unary and binary encoding. Um, so you get... Um, up to eight spots, but I only need four binary digits, and of course this grows much faster in terms of the efficiency. <coughs> and notice that classical computers use an, uh, a second level of encoding with floating point numbers to give them even more efficiency at the expense of precision. But this is important um, for why these uh, computers are so effective. Um, so now let's think about how we might encode a problem into a quantum computer. 
And I'm going to tell you about the continuous time version, so not the gate model stuff. So I want to take a physical, a set of qubits. I want to engineer a Hamiltonian interactions between them. I want to let that run, time dependent or control it. I might, um, and then I want, after some time, I then want to measure and see what the new state of those qubits is, and I want that to be giving me a, a good guess to my answer. But then I have to encode a, a problem into that Hamiltonian such that um, changing it in time or letting it run is likely to find the answer for me. And the simplest way to do that is encode the answer into the ground state of the Hamiltonian, so you're finding the lowest energy. That's a physically well-defined thing to do, is to look for the lowest energy. So here first, there's my I'm in computational basis states. If I write J, what I mean is that I have a n qubits, and I have each of them is a 0 or a 1 to represent the number J. And I can make a superposition of all of the numbers from 0 to J mi um, minus 1, um, just like that, 0 plus 1, and you tensor that up, multiply it out, all the possible bit strings are in there. So if I just want to find the state M, this is the search problem, so it's a toy problem in many ways. All I have to do with my Hamiltonian is put the identity on everything except the state I want to find. I make it one unit of energy lower. And then by construction, my ground state is the state I want to find and nothing else. Of course, that looks a bit messy in terms of other, uh, uh, the, the actual Hamiltonian, but it's very simple to write down like that. And then it gives you something that you can calculate with analytically and understand how this works. But here's a more complicated example. Suppose I have a condition, a constraint, that I've got three qubits and I only want one, and exactly one of them to be one and the other two to be zero, but I don't mind which one. If I give, make a term in my Hamiltonian, which is identity minus a Z operator, a Pauli Z operator, so here are the, the gates, uh, Z is, is one, zero, zero, minus one. And then I square it. A little bit of thought will show you that that gives a lower energy to the three states with one spin as one and the other two as zero. And the others are all higher energy. And so there's, there are recipes for how to encode constraints into Hamiltonians like this. And so, and in fact, you can just take Pauli Z operators and products of Pauli Zs, and you can encode any classical optimization problem into that setting. And it's a constructive um, way of doing this. So, so these are just simple examples, but it's, it's then something we know how to do. So, so this is the setting for computing I'm thinking about. Here's quantum walks finally appearing. There's adiabatic quantum computing. Um, these are continuous time quantum walks, and they, they essentially use the same Hamiltonian form. It's just how you do the time dependence. I'll show you that on the next slide or two. And then if we have open system effects, we get a quantum annealing in... Um, the terms are not used consistently in the literature, but this is um, the picture I'm using. Um, of course, there's also unwanted noise that messes up our computation, and that's thinking of coming another dimension out of the board. We never get to that perfect picture. That would be um, with controlling other unwanted environmental influences. So quickly to remind you what happens with adiabatic quantum computing, we start in the ground state of the Hamiltonian we can prepare easily. Um, we slowly turn that off and turn on our problem Hamiltonian. And if we do it slowly enough, the adiabatic theorem says that we will stay in the same eigenstate, in this case, the ground state. So long as the Hamiltonian's gapped and has a few nice properties, 
But since we are choosing our Hamiltonian, we can ensure that they do have the right properties. So the caveats are not a problem in this setting because we have control over our Hamiltonian choices. The problem then is how slowly do you have to do it and does this give you a quantum advantage? Um, so for a continuous time quantum walk, which you know, mostly be familiar with, it's usually described in terms of the adjacency matrix of a graph. If it's an undirected graph, the matrix is symmetric, therefore you can make a Hamiltonian from it. Normally you put, make it the Laplacian and put the diagonal in as the degree of the graph. This is, um, makes the calculations work more easily. And then you just run the Hamiltonian for a, a certain time on your initial state and then measure. Very simple. But now, what does it mean to encode into qubits for a quantum walk? Because if we don't do this encoding, we will have an exponentially inefficient way to represent our problem and we're unlikely to get a quantum advantage out of it. So, this is the crucial slide for how to relate the graph for the quantum walk to the qubits. So these little things here are my qubits. If my graph has two, is a path of, like this with two sites and one link, that's just one qubit, zero or one. I just need the label for each of the sites. I turn it up to the next dimension, I have a square. I now need two qubits to label the four sites. And there they are, two qubits and my little dotted red line. Um, that's the problem Hamiltonian. So what we're going to do is make, for example, for search, we would make one of these states lower energy. That implies I have some sigma z terms that intera make interactions between my qubits. And then I've drawn the cube for you with three qubits. And of course, we can go higher. So Nick drew the uh, six-dimensional hypercube. That's fine. I, um, it was for a different paper. I can show you the diagrams at some point, but I'm stopping here. And of course, my quantum walk on a hypercube is especially simple. It's just sigma x, single sigma x terms. They do bit flips. A bit flip takes me from here to here. Or we'll flip it again, I go back. If I flip the other qubit, I'll go from here to here or down again. Um, so that my Hamilton is just a sum of signals, single sigma x terms. The ground state is that nice superposition of all possible bit strings. Um, so you can see it's fitting nicely into the picture I already have of the computation. So this is the search problem in this setting. There's the Hamil problem Hamiltonian again with that M. This is what it looks like in Pauli operators. It's nasty. So physically implementing this is a mess. We have a paper for how to do it with some gadgets. I'm not going to talk more about this. You can ask me afterwards if you're interested. It's interesting because then you can use it for testbed problems. This is not thinking about real quantum computers uh, or real, so you're solving real problems. It's thinking about testing your hardware before you use it for something. And here I've written the, the HH is that quantum walk Hamiltonian on the hypercube that I just showed you. And there's the problem Hamiltonian. And then the A and the B are my time dependence. I have a choice about when I turn one on and which one on and off. If A and B are constant, I'm doing a quantum walk. Um, if they time vary, I'm doing something like adiabatic or maybe some hybrid between the two. Um, and we know for the search problem, we get a quadratic speed up. So here it is in pictures. If the equations are harder to use, to understand. So the, um, the quantum walk is going to give oscillations. That's the 
the picture on the left-hand side just shows you both Hamiltonians turned on and just left to run. This is um, the right-hand side with the line going up monotonically is adiabatic quantum computing. And you can see we have curved lines for turning the Hamiltonians on and off. If you just do a linear ramp, you do not get an, uh, a speed up at all of a classical. So you have to do something smarter with how you control it already just to get that quadratic search speed up. In between, you can see I flattened them toward um, there. So I'm doing something halfway between the two of uh, something that is, has some adiabatic character and some quantum walk character. And you can see the darker line has some oscillations, but is climbing. So that's why I like this um, setting. I've now related two different models of quantum computing, and I can take many things we know about quantum walks and apply them across to the time-dependent ones, and vice versa. We can really learn some things when we join up and see how two different things relate. So this is all published in a long PRA. There are many, many technical details. I'm going to quickly show you, we're getting close to time here, and I want to show you one more thing. So in fact, I'm going to skip, I think, that, the single avoided crossing model. That's analytically how you solve the search problem. Um, it's in the paper I gave. But I want to tell you in a, just a few minutes something about more realistic problems. Um, so with adiabatic, it's clear that in theory we can solve problems because the, the, the adiabatic theorem says we can solve it. The question is, can we get a, a quantum advantage, a speed up? But nobody had thought to try quantum walks on these problems because there was no theory for how it might work. So we said, OK, we have the, com the classical computer simulations. We'll try and we'll see what happens. So this is a classical spin glass that we've mapped into a quantum one. So I just have pairwise terms, spin terms, and single um, fields on my, um, on my qubits. And if you think a spin glass is, gets frustrated, if I th you think of three, a triangle, one, two, three, if I have the interaction such that they all want each pair wants to be opposite. On a triangle, that's not possible. So there will always be a compromise. Something will have higher energy. So that's why where the spin glass nature comes from. We know that adiabatic can find them faster than guessing. But what happens when we put a quantum walk on here? So first, we need to know how to set the hopping rate. It turns out that we have some nice broad peaks here. This is all numerical work. So choosing a hopping rate is not too critical. And it doesn't work well if you have the search problem. You need to know precisely how to set gamma. Um, and that's another reason why, in practice, you can't easily do this. Now we have a problem that the dynamics don't look like a nice sinusoidal oscillation. So we do a time average. And what that means is we sample from the distribution at different times. And on average, um, we will at least do as well as um, where that line is asymptoting to. It's also easy to calculate the limit of the, the, that time average with some mild assumptions. And this is what we get. Um, so. On this side, look at this side first. So 1 over n is guessing. So if you were just going to guess the ground state, that's how badly it would scale with the number of spins. 1 over square root n is that gray dotted line, is what you would do if you just applied the search algorithm to this, and you expect to do quadratically better. What we get with applying a quantum walk is the blue-purple line there. Um, the reason we've got two, I've got two lines there is to show uh, we calculated some points from the, the infinite time average. But if we do a short time average to show that it, agrees, it, as, it 
um, converges to the infinite time average very quickly, um, so that it isn't an, a factor in the, a significant factor in the scaling. So we get something that scales as n to the 0.41. We beat searching. I'll explain why on the next slide. The details are now in this NJP paper. <coughs> but before you think, hey, great, that's wonderful, we know a classical algorithm that's even better than this. So now we need to get smarter and take our classical algorithm and put a quantum subroutine in it so that we can really get something that, that beats the best known classical. And this side is the beginning of this work. So the green line is the classical on the same data sets. The red one is the hardest of those done with a quantum a hybrid algorithm. So instead of doing exactly the quantum walk, we've rounded the corners on it. And it does much better. And then we optimize the gamma value, which is the black lines at the top. But we think that may be cheating in that you wouldn't know how to do this in a real problem. So we have to step back and go, what is the algorithm that you're definitely going to be able to do without some privileged knowledge of the problem? So this is the one that explains why we get better than search. We have correlations in there. And we're exploiting the correlations. So we have the pairwise terms here. And the hypercube driver with the single spin flips is exactly what you need to take a pairwise term that isn't satisfied and flip it so it's satisfied. Um, whereas if you put it on the complete graph, you're flipping a random number of spins each time. And it's like guessing. Um, and classically, you wouldn't do random guessing. Classically, you would do a Monte Carlo, and you would flip a single spin, see if it helps, and take it if it, and don't take it if it doesn't. And so classically, this is what you would do. And so you do not want to do the wrong thing quantum, just because it's easier to calculate analytically. So, um, and these are different versions of tests we did to show that it was really the pairwise correlations and the hypercube driver that gave us this advantage. So just um, a last thing before we finish up to remind you that quantum walks are indeed universal for quantum problems as well. Everything I've talked about is a classical problem. And that's not fully universal quantum computing. I can only encode classical problems into my sigma z Hamiltonians. I need to add more. But they're proved universal. But in a setting in which it's encoded. That's the graph. That's the encoding on qubits. If you don't encode your single walk or quantum walk, you will get not get the quantum advantage. If you want to use it in a physical setting, you have to have multiple walkers that interact. And there, again, from Andrew Childs is the proof of that. It's cellular automata if you have multiple interacting ones. The bosons are intermediate, and they're multiple non-interacting particles doing a quantum walk. So this is where it all gets very interesting. And fermions are different, again, because um, they have the exclusion principle. So I'm done, apart from my summary slides. I've told you about how we can find spin glass ground states, which is very promising for applying quantum walks to a wider range of problems, because they are, they, their character is similar to real optimization problems that you, you might want to solve. They have correlations. Interesting problems have correlations in them. If there are no correlations, then averages and random guessing are, are, are characterize the problem completely. Um, I've told you a bit more about the background for why what the setting is. Um, and I've told you something about the background framework. There's some more of the references for that. And when Dom gets here this afternoon, you can also bother him about all of that theory. So where are we going next? Let's see if quantum walks work on other programs. We know they work on Max2Sat. Some nice work coming out with, uh, so Lewis and Puya are uh, master's students <laughs> who've worked on this. Um, Ashley Montanaro has done branch and bound algorithms that improved the speed up for 
with a quantum walk search. But the way it's a discrete time walk and it's not in, easy to implement the way he's done the proof. We would like a continuous time version. Um, and then there is also work on open system effects in this setting. So thank you very much. Thank you, Viv. Uh, is there any? Uh, yeah, Jingo. Uh, you, you mentioned if you ramp up uh, the Hamiltonian, if it's just a linear ramp, uh, you, you, you won't get any speed up. So you have to design it like a curvy. Mm -hmm. How do you define that curve? And uh, to find that curve, would that be computationally costly? So this is how you find it for the search problem. So the, the method is from Roland and Cerf which they did for the complete graph, where it's actually quite easy to calculate. Um, so in the paper with, um, probably on the next slide, yeah, the paper with James Morley's work that I gave in the reference, we did the calculation for the hypercube graph. It's, more, uh, it's a more difficult calculation. Uh, read the details, it, it's, 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 it's fun. But, but anyway, that, that's the method that you use um, is to solve this equation for the function of s and t. There's the s dt. You have to solve yeah. that equation. I just wonder, when you scale it up, even for complete graph, how complicated uh, this will be uh, to, 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 to define that curve. I would imagine yeah, the curve if, is, if the yeah. end goes uh, upwards, you, you will have more oscillation. It's, so, it, is that cost included when you talk about speed up? So. When you, um, for search, this is essential. There's only one avoided crossing. You, the only thing that matters is you slow down precisely there, okay? With the spin glasses, they have a more complicated picture, but it turns out it's not critical that you exactly solve that equation. So this is what um, this graph is about. So that's where you have to be precise with the solution. And this is this. So everything with this is it's been done with quantum walks. So there's no uh, equation for how you do it, right? And the work that I showed earlier, the, the reference I gave earlier, I believe they used a linear ramp with that, and it, that's not where you get the speed up in this setting. It's a different problem. It has correlations in the ZZ terms, and the whole character of things is different and less well studied. Is there any other quick, very quick question? Yeah, I think uh, my question is related to uh, Jimbo mm -hmm. one. Because uh, I guess at least you, uh, you must know the gap uh, to solve the problem. Okay. No, we don't know. We don't know the gap in, in the spin glasses. I mean, we ag I mean yes, we, we know it, but we don't use it to set mm -hmm. any parameters. So we... We have, what we're doing, what we do is a heuristic for gamma that is just based on the energy scale in the problem. Um, so in fact, we set it taking the, the smallest and the largest energies. Um, but these, in the setting we're working, you decide the energy scale in your physical computer, right? You, you know that you can set between plus and minus this, and so you, it only takes a little bit of, a, of testing when you're setting your sigma terms to know what. Um, so, I mean, the, the, in the random case, we know the distribution of those values, so, so we can, uh, so again, that, that is in the NJP paper for the, the random version um, to, you have to do a, a rever back engineer the earth function for to say what's the likely spread of your your eigenvalues, um, but it, but this can be done just based on the problem characteristics, um, and then we find there's a factor of 0.85 between that and the spin glasses. But I mean this fa factor so small with a broad peak, um, sorry, like this one, 
a factor of 0.85 on that does not, does, does not kill your, your speed up. So we've done a lot of work around that that would be a lot, lot longer talk, but it, the, the paper is published and you can look at these details. So yeah, that was a very critical question for us. And the first thing we found was these broad peaks and went, okay, there is a chance this can work just based on you know, overall system parameters to set the... the, the so the, if the, I understood, you, you, you need to know the range of the eigenvalues, but not the, the specific right. eigenvalues. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, because you're encoding it, so as I say, the number of qubits you have says what, and if you are, your distribution is drawn from a, a, roughly a Gaussian, then you, from the number of values you draw, you know the likely range, and you can set, the, set it based on that. Um, so as I say, that's an Earth function done backwards. What's your most likely um, thing? Um, and and that, that's in the paper for the, for the details. And the fact that the spin glass, of course, does differ in the tails, that's exactly the point. And so numerically, we looked at how that, what that difference was. And as I say, it's a factor of 0.85 on the data we're using. Um, but we have these broad peaks, and the scaling of the peaks is, um, is very favorable compared to this is narrowing exponentially. Your precision has to get exponentially good for, for the search setting. So, so yeah, these are very good questions, and there's a lot of technical detail in the paper trying to, to get as, as precise as we can about which way they go. Okay, let's thank Viv. Um, next mm -hmm. speaker, Jingbo Wang, mm -hmm. from the University of Western Australia.